Good evening and welcome to Chicago Tonight. I'm Paris Schutz. And I'm Brandis Friedman. On the show tonight. Families are getting clobbered by the cost of everyday things. Inflation is rising at its fastest rate in 40 years. We look at the impact on consumers and the markets. The city says a controversial metal shredding plant would not adversely impact the health of southeast side residents. Mayor Lightfoot's plan to sue gang members gains approval from a city council committee. Well, Ukraine still is the lifeblood of the area. As a, as a potential Russian invasion of Ukraine looms, we visit Ukrainian Village to check in with residents and community leaders. No single person can be him. That's why we have two performers playing him in this show. We preview a new theater production honoring a black classical music composer. And there's all kinds of music on local stages. Theater critic Hetty Weiss recommends five other shows to see. There are two kinds of Irish families. There's the hitting kind and there's the teasing kind. We look back at our 2015 interview with author and satirist P.J. O'Rourke, who died this week. And Brandis and Paris, as you mentioned, I'm in Ukrainian Village, where I will be reporting live tonight for our Chicago Tonight in Your Neighborhood series. Ukrainian Village is part of the West Town community area, and it has long been an enclave for Ukrainian Americans. And this area is feeling the impact of tensions with Russia. We'll be speaking with those who still have family in the Ukraine. But for now, back to you. Amanda, thank you. And now to some of today's top stories. Hazardous travel conditions on tonight's commute. A winter weather advisory is in effect until 9 o'clock this evening due to wind-driven snow and slippery road conditions. Chicago snow totals are predicted to range from 2 to 5 inches, with winds gusting to a high of 40 miles per hour. The city has deployed more than 280 salt spreaders, and snowfall is expected to taper off overnight. Political theater in Springfield today as nine Illinois House Republicans were removed from the chamber over their refusal to wear face masks. A majority of lawmakers voted for their colleagues' removal after they refused to wear masks for three days in chambers. The House rule requires all members wear a mask in session unless they are eating, drinking, or speaking into the microphone. Before the dismissal, State Representatives Andrew Chesney and Lakeisha Collins shared a heated exchange. And you're worried about a cloth mask? Absolutely you're worried about a cloth mask. But then you'll be in the break room, you'll be eating, and you'll be with lobbyist dinners, and you'll be outside these chambers is the height of hypocrisy. You say you're fighting for those without a voice. You're not fighting for anybody. 800 people died in your city, and you said nothing. Let's not forget it's mindsets like yours that created those murders. Your privilege. And to say that we are here playing games and that we're not doing real work, look at what you're doing. You're interrupting a session that you know we have important bills out there that we need to vote on. Illinois Secretary of State Jesse White has endorsed Anna Valencia to be his successor. White's endorsement puts his political machine behind the now Chicago City Clerk, which could help her win over black voters. She's running in a crowded Democratic primary, though. It includes former State Treasurer Alexei Janulius and 17th Ward Alderman David Moore. When White leaves his position in 2023, he will have served 24 years in the Secretary of State's office. Up next, members of Chicago's Ukrainian community shared their thoughts about increasing tensions abroad. Stay with us. Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by Alexandra and John Nichols, the Jim and Kay Maybe family, the Polk Brothers Foundation, and the support of these donors. Former Chicago Mayor Jane Byrne designated Ukrainian Village an official neighborhood in 1983, an appellation that has kept the heritage alive in West Town. Our Amanda Vinicky and producer Marissa Nelson visited the area today as the latest stop in our Chicago Tonight In Your Neighborhood series. And Amanda joins us right now. Amanda, where are you? 
Well, Paris, we're in Ukrainian village for obvious reasons, given the ongoing crisis in Ukraine. This morning, President Joe Biden says he expects Russia to invade its western neighbor within days. And that situation is particularly poignant here, given the area's still large Ukrainian, large Ukrainian American population, that is. Terrorist Rose has lived in Ukrainian village for some 60 years. Walk up and down Chicago Avenue from Western to Damon, he says you'll see Ukrainian flags, restaurants, businesses. He works for a bank. A lot of the stores still are here, the social services agencies, medical professionals that are here. Uh, so you can you can do everything you want uh, in the Ukrainian sense with uh, Ukrainian language, uh, Ukrainian uh, Ukrainian understanding of the why you know what what motivates you and how you go about business. Ukrainians have moved to the neighborhood in waves, mixing with Germans and Poles in the 1800s, then another wave after World War I, and Drozid's generation immigrated post-World War II. With time, the area has changed. In recent years, hip restaurants and shops without Ukrainian ties have popped up. This is where you are now. I would say this is like more of like the cultural hub before uh, the neighborhood changed it was kind of like a bubble where you know anyone that would come in they'd feel like maybe they were back in ukraine where they necessarily didn't have to assimilate as as much as they do now Still mixed in with these newer establishments are Ukrainian cultural centers like the Ukrainian Institute of Modern Art, which began as an underground collaboration for Ukrainian artists to exhibit their work when other galleries didn't take them seriously. Now, several churches in the area have also long served as community centers, especially now, again, as tensions with Russia heighten. On Sunday, St. Nicholas kept its doors open for a vigil for Ukraine. Father Vladimir Kushner says parishioners, many still with family overseas, have a mix of feelings, fear, frustration, anger. There's all kinds of emotions and feelings involved in the current situation because we live in the 21st century and it seems like unrealistic, unreal uh, that our neighboring country um, threatens us with, with the war. It just absolutely unjust and uh, unfair. Yarna Klimshak is among those with family still in Ukraine. She was actually supposed to have left today to visit her new goddaughter. Instead, she heeded the warnings of the president and canceled her trip. I'll be uh, watching virtually for sure. Um, and of course, I will support that little girl for the rest of her life, right? That's still my connection there, even if I can't be there physically. Um, I do plan to go back hopefully later in the summer when things slow down, but of course we'll see how things shake up and hopefully the West will be there to help so things do become calmer with time. She says when other kids in, around Chicago were sleeping in, maybe watching cartoons on Saturday mornings, she spent her weekends in this neighborhood, including attending a Ukrainian school. She also spent summers visiting Ukraine. Her relatives, she says, live closer to Poland than to Russia and aren't in a panic, but she says they are making contingencies. What happens if our water supply is cut off? What happens if the gas is gone? What happens if we have no more electricity? How do we sustain the population? How do people continue to thrive every single day? If Russia does invade, Yarna fears her last trip to Ukraine this past summer may, be her, may have been her last visit with her grandma, seen in this video, waving goodbye to her granddaughter. Yarna was three when she moved to Chicago with her brother and with her parents. They were part of the most recent wave of Ukrainian immigrants who came to the United States after Ukraine declared independence from the Soviet Union in 1991. Mom Maria Klimchuk says that they were religious refugees, refugees that is, who brought with them only two suitcases. And uh, was no English, it was no job, but uh, was a dream in a packet to be a nice American citizen, but never forget about Ukraine. Now, Klimchuk is the curator of the Ukrainian National Museum of Chicago, where we are at now, kind of them to host us. It is a position, she says, that allows her to celebrate her two homes, the Ukraine and the U.S. 
Chicago specifically, a city that she says is unique. You can walk uh, by any street and you will see uh, Lithuanian, American, Irish, uh, uh, Italian, Greek, uh, Puerto Rican. You see all those community around and working in a museum, you understand uh, this uh, actually quality of the city because uh, the city is open to the world. And uh, I never feel that I am foreigner. I always said this is my home. Now her daughter is counting on the U.S. and the West to help protect Ukraine from Russia. She says in the 21st century, you cannot hide atrocities. If Even if Russia does pull back, Tara Strozid predicts that that will not be the end of pressure from Putin. He says they've heard that before and he expects Russia will continue to come back with, on Ukraine with pressure, but he says in the face of it, Ukraine has been and Ukrainians will continue to be resilient. Much more ahead, but for now, sending it back to you in the studio. All right, Amanda, a lot on the mind of Ukrainian Americans in Chicago and Ukrainians uh, all over the world. Thank you very much. And inflation is rising at its fastest rate in 40 years. The Consumer Price Index, which measures the cost of a broad range of everyday consumer goods, has surged 7.5 percent over the past year. President Joe Biden says the reason is, quote, the supply chains have been cut off. But economists say the picture is more complicated than that. Here's a little bit of what President Biden had to say about inflation earlier this week. Families are getting clobbered by the cost of everyday things. You know, I know that gas and food prices are up. We're working to bring them down. I grew up in a family where the price of the pump was felt in the kitchen. So while we work on supply chains and we work on bringing down the cost of the things that we're talking about have gone up so high, we still have other ways we can reduce the burden on working class families. And joining us now to share their insights are David Secura, chief U.S. market strategist for investment research firm Morningstar, and Philip Braun, an economist and professor of finance at Northwestern University's Kellogg School of Management. Thank you both for being here. Uh, first to you, David Secura. You heard President Biden uh, blaming all of this on supply chain issues due to demand and the pandemic. Is that the full story? Well, like anything else, there's always more to it than just that. But yes, you know, the supply chain disruptions and the bottlenecks certainly have been a very large part of it. You know, a big part of the inflation that we've seen have been in the consumer durable area, as well as the automotive sector, where the you know shortages that we've seen in semiconductors, you know, really have lowered the amount of supply coming there. But with demand still remaining high, that you know, we've seen prices there. And now we're starting to see that also leak into other areas, as he mentioned, you know, some of the agricultural products and the food at home certainly has been rising as well. Uh, Philip Braun, President Biden, says he understands the pain, especially for working class citizens and his administration wants to do something. But what are the tools that they have that can tackle this inflation? Very little. The White House has very little control over inflation. Most of it is going to have at this point has to be managed by the Federal Reserve. And to that issue, uh, David Sequeira, uh, there's whispers that the Federal Reserve will meet and will raise rates multiple times uh, over the next year. Do you anticipate that happening? Uh, we do. And in fact, when you look at kind of the market implied expectations for the year, you know, they've reasoned quite substantially over the past couple of months. So at this point, I think the market is really expecting them not only raise rates here in March, but raise rates pretty much every meeting for the rest of this year. Philip Braun, should the Fed have been doing this all along? I mean, are they a little late to the table here, just given the fact that this has not been transitory inflation? It has persisted. Yeah, very much so. So the Federal Reserve is behind the eight ball. And even today, they're not being aggressive enough. The, um, the uh, inflation currently is out of control. The uh, Federal Reserve should, at this point, already be incre increasing um, uh, inflation and uh, interest rate targets, and they're not. Uh, and they should be in the future increasing interest rate targets at a very high clip. And, and, and uh, Philip Brown, are we anticipating about a quarter of a point uh, each time if they do it multiple times or higher than that? Uh, it's unclear at this point. So they say they're going to raise rates in March. Um, the initial expectation was for a quarter point, uh, but there's some people talking maybe half a point. Philip Braun, 
as is always the case, it seems markets tend to get spooked by even the whispers of uh, raising rates. So how do you believe markets will react to these interest rate hikes if they come? They've already reacted, and that's a critical thing. Uh, markets, what, to affect the economy, the interest rate increase really has to be a surprise. And so this quarter point that people are talking about is already embedded in the market. That's one of the reasons why the market's been declining. David Sakara, does that mean that perhaps there won't be uh, uh, an unexpected dip uh, when markets do rise, that they've been preparing for this, basically? Well, they have, but I think, you know, that's just one factor amongst many of what we've seen on you know, the market decline thus far this year. So coming into 2022, you know, in our outlook, we published, we thought the markets were actually overvalued, just purely on a valuation approach coming into the year. You know, we noted that there were a number of different headwinds that the market was going to face, you know, tightening monetary policy, you know, was one of those, you know, inflation running, you know, much hotter than expected, rising interest rates. And then just the economy is going to be slowing this year. So again, we still expect the economy to come in at about 3.9%, pretty robust rate when you think about it on a historical basis, but slower than last year. So all of those factors combined together, I think has helped push the market down. And then as you mentioned you know, earlier, you know, the global tensions in Ukraine, it's just another risk factor that we've had to add in. And David Sakara, just a, a lot of competing factors uh, pushing and pulling on the environment. You have higher inflation, but you have retail sales that were up 3.8% from December to January. So if Americans are so worried about inflation, why are they continuing to spend in such high numbers? Well, I think you also have to remember, too, what the pandemic has caused. So over the past two years, we had a big shift in consumer spending. You know, spending historically had been more for services than goods. But with the pandemic, you know, really not allowing people to go out and do some of the things that they had been doing in the past. We saw a big shift in that spending away from services and into goods. And in fact, that's part of what's causing you know, inflation now. Now, the good news is, is that we do believe that inflation will start to moderate in the second half of the year. Our inflation outlook for this year is gonna be an average of 3.6% for the full year. And actually, when we look at next year, we think inflation probably dips below 2% before it goes back to more of a normalized 2% area thereafter. It'd have to moderate, moderate quite a bit to get down for, from 7.5 down to 3.6 percent. Philip Braun, what are the ways that Americans feel these inflationary pressures the most? I mean, there are things like used car prices that are up 55 percent. Are there certain sectors uh, that uh, Americans tend to spend money in that, that are really um, higher than others? They probably feel it the most at the grocery store where meat prices, poultry prices have gone up dramatically. And that's probably where they feel it the most. But you're correct. Uh, used car, new car prices are way up. Um, but it's really, I think, in the grocery store where it's really felt. And David Braun, you brought up the issue of uh, labor shortages. I mean, there's, there are more jobs out there than uh, folks that are taking them right now. How does that impact uh, inflationary pressures? And are wages keeping up with the demand for workers? I'm sorry, who was that, that question was, that, that was to? David Secure, that's to you. Okay. So, yeah, so, you know, we're definitely seeing, you know, some increases in, you know, the wages right now. You know, we don't expect to see, you know, like a wage price inflation, you know, spiral in this, you know, aspect. You know, we do think that, you know, as wages are increasing in the second half of this year, again, as consumer spending starts to normalize, as the pandemic recedes, you know, this spring and into the summer, you know, more people will go back to, you know, the services that they've been spending money on in the past. We see lots of excess capacity in the markets in the services area. And then we also expect to see, you know, those higher wages be able to bring more employees back into the workforce, you know, that have been out of the workforce for the past two years. So that will also help alleviate, you know, a lot of those inflationary problems pressures that we're seeing right now. All right, well, we'll watch for that uh, action from the Fed. And our thanks to David Sequeira and Philip Braun. Thanks so much for joining us. All right, thank, thank you. you. And now we toss it to Brandis and the impact of a metal shredding company on area residents. Brandis. Paris, neighbors around the South Darien community are eagerly awaiting the city's final word on whether to grant a permit to a controversial Southside recycling plant. Earlier this week, a city assessment said the plant would not have an adverse effect on residents' health, but advocates who've been protesting the plant disagree. Joining us now with more are Yesenia Chavez, a Southeast Side resident and a member of United Neighbors of the 10th Ward. 
and Victor Henderson, an attorney with Henderson Parks, who has been representing 10th Ward residents in court. Now, we also invited representatives from Southside Recycling and the Chicago Department of Public Health for this conversation. They were unable to join us tonight, but we do have statements from each of them that we will get to in just a bit. But first, I want to get reaction from the two of you, Yesenia and Victor. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Yesenia, let's start with you, please. What's your reaction to this report? Um, it's very tamed for now. Um, fairly disappointed. Uh, the process is inequitable. It's not transparent whatsoever. Victor Henderson, so. what's, what's yours? Well, you know, we've been fighting the city for a year, year and a half now, maybe a little longer. Uh, and all the way through, they have been less than transparent, which is diametrically opposed to how the administration presented itself when it was coming into office, that it was going to be transparent, that it was going to shine the light on how the city operated. Uh, and what we have with this process is just the opposite. You know, as the Tribune editorial said just a few days ago, um, there's almost no light on the process, and that's uh, un unfair to the citizens uh, of the city all across the board. So, you know, despite these findings uh, from this report that some residents face risks of chronic disease, um, that that some will. Uh, the study says that it is still within EPA guidelines. Yesenia, talk about uh, some of your issues with those EPA guidelines. Well, the fact of the matter is that there's no safe threshold of exposure to any particulate matter concentrations or any pollution concentrations in general. So I'm quite interested to see as far as how they calculated this and came up with these numbers, um, because it's on the EPA website that there is no safe threshold. So regardless of whatever, how minuscule the risk may be after their calculations, the point of the matter is that there's already chronic disease present in our neighborhood. These people are already living with the consequences of whatever chronic diseases they have and any conditions that are gonna exacerbate those conditions should not be present whatsoever. Now, CDPH, the Chicago Department of Public Health, released a statement after this week's community meeting and it reads in part, quote, Engaging the community has been a top priority of this process from the beginning. CDPH has been listening to community voices and concerns regarding this permit for well over a year. This has included convening multiple town hall meetings, ongoing meetings with local stakeholders, systematic review of thousands of public comments, and daily social media monitoring. Of course, as we've, you know, as we've been discussing this evening, Victor, you all have had a lot of concerns about what you call a lack of transparency about this process. Tell us a little bit more about that. Well, what, what the city says is true and it's not true. Um, the long and the short of it is they've gone through the motions. Um, they have not uh, put the information out for it to be tested. They have not put the information out for it to be examined. Um, they have not been uh, you know, open to having people take a look behind what's going on at the curtain. Um, as you well know, there was a deal cut uh, with the city and General Iron back in, I think it was September of 2019. Uh, General Iron has been very, uh, loud about the fact that they have invested $80 million in this plant. Uh, there have been multiple uh, aldermen uh, and state officials who have taken money from General Iron through lobbying. Um, and so at the end of the day, this is really about uh, the city of Chicago, even the state of Illinois, uh, standing with the polluters as opposed to the people, uh, standing with the powerful as opposed to the people in the community. Uh, and it's just one additional uh, indication that uh, we, we can't trust the people in City Hall and what they're doing. It's, it's really a travesty and, and it affects more than just the people in the 10th Ward. It's, it's how the city does business and it's, it really speaks to about democracy in general and, uh, and the people in City Hall are failing us. And uh, of course, you know, we, we talk about the physical health uh, risks or potential risks, Yesenia, but please uh, tell us a little bit about uh, the impact of uh, these sites on the mental health of residents in the area. I mean, where do I start? I've been seeing developments like this happen since I was a child and it's still continuing. And I, I would have never thought that the same pollution that my grandfather had to face in 1974 when he got here, I would have to be combating against now today. Um, I'm a third generation Southeast side resident as are many of the people on the Stop Gender Iron campaign, which is a multi-generational campaign. And to see high school students in distress, to see their anxieties just through the roof because they do not understand why a metal shredding company, metal recycling, whatever you wanna call it, is being located less than a half a mile across the street from where they're being sent to develop their brains and being sent to develop as students is, is gonna be operating you can't explain that. You can't quantify that whatsoever. 
So um, to say the least, it's, it's very disheartening to see that the Chicago Department of Public Health is standing with polluters and is standing on the side of General Iron despite a $500,000 fine that they had to pay last year for a Clean Air Act violation. Um, and, and the experience is just overwhelming. Now, Southside Recycling, they also sent a statement that reads in part, quote, by CDPH's own statements, Southside Recycling has been subject to the most rigorous and comprehensive study of a proposed industrial facility ever conducted in Chicago. The facts are clear. We built the most environmentally conscious metal recycling facility in the country, but politicians, government officials, and the media are being cowed by a small but vocal opposition and their persistent false narratives and misinformation aimed at demonizing our business and recycling. Uh, Yesenia, what do you make of Southside Recycling calling opposition misinformation? They have yet to point out what what the misinformation is so i don't really care for that statement personally i have yet to see any evidence prove that an operation of a metal shredding company like general iron like Southside recycling is beneficial to the health of residents especially the development of children so whatever misinformation they're pointing out i would love to talk about because they have yet to do they have yet to do so victory we've got about 30 seconds left how could the city have gone about this entire process differently outside of well, the transparency issues you know, first and foremost, if it was such a great thing, it would have stayed in Lincoln Park. Um, anything that's good, they would have wanted it in Lincoln Park. They would have wanted it in Winneka. They would have wanted it in Glencoe. Um, but because it's bad, they throw it down to the 10th Ward. They think that the black people and the brown people and the women and the others in that area uh, don't have the sense enough to fight, don't have the gumption to fight. Um, the city should have done and could have done what it said in the beginning when the administration first got into office that they were going to uh, show the light and be different than prior administrations. And they have been the same as the administration before them and the administration before them, you know, and so we need to see a change. Okay, we'll have to leave it there. Our thanks to Yesenia Chavez and Victor Henderson for joining us. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Up next, a new theater production honors a black classical composer. We'll share a preview right after this. Certainly we can celebrate, but we also have to recognize what so many people have gone through because of racism and what people continue to go through. I think that Americans are finally beginning to embrace that we are African, we are indigenous, we are European, we are Asian, we are everything. And there's much more ahead on the program, including the latest in Mayor Lightfoot's controversial plan to sue Chicago gangs. But first, musician, friend to Mozart, music teacher to Marie Antoinette, and skilled fencer. Those are just a few of the accolades that describe the man known to be the first black composer of the 18th century. Arts correspondent Angel Ido introduces us to the Chevalier. After all, you are an immigrant just like me. Meet Joseph Bolognay, Chevalier de St. George. Well, not the real him, of course. Who are they? I can hear you asking him. Well, the king has created a new force, la police de noir. He's said to be the first black French composer of the 18th century. His life and legacy are now being highlighted in a new production titled The Chevalier. We fight for slavery's abolishment, Mozart. It's all about this intriguing, incredible man who John Adams described as the most accomplished man in Europe, uh, a fencer, a composer, a violinist, uh, a crusader for uh, abolishing slavery, um, a real Renaissance man. And uh, this friendship with Mozart, really Bill, um, centered this whole play around that particular fortunate coming together of these two great figures in Paris in, in 1778. Le coup de grace. It's written and directed by Bill Barclay of Concert Theatre Works, who is also an actor in the show. We're trying to provide a deeper survey of his music. There are 16 different movements of his music represented in the show. And there's also his life, his psychology, his sense of humor, his relationship to fencing, how he was knighted, his relationship to all these other characters who are much more famous than he, to try to lift up this man's biography in our understanding, replace him where he belongs in our music history, and honor him. No single person can be him. That's why we have two performers playing him in this show. We have an actor and we have a violinist. There isn't anyone on planet Earth who could be the Chevalier of Saint George.
On the musical side stands Brendan Elliott. What does it mean to embody such a prominent classical composer? Playing this role feels a little um, unreal because it makes me realize how, how hard he really worked to you know, carve out this entire life for himself. Elliot is accompanied by the music of the Baroque Orchestra, conducted by Dame Jane Glover. This partnership aims to contextualize the Chevalier's music with both his life story and compositions. And there weren't many like him. I mean, he really was a sort of one-off um, who survived spectacularly uh, against so many odds. When he and Mozart came together, they were both outsiders. And in a way, it was Boulogne who had more stacked up against him who survived better. Boulogne is coming out of the gallant style of early classical Parisian music. It sort of ends with Boulogne, as Boulogne stopped composing and started fighting in the revolution. He actually ended it himself by deciding that there was something more important to do, abolish slavery. Winner, winner, chicken dinner. <laughs> On the acting side stands R.J. Foster. Now, despite just recently learning about the multifaceted artist, he says there are still many parallels between the 18th century production and today. You have a black man who has a title, he has some influence, but also he deals with racism. And it's in a different sort of way than which we deal with here, but it's also mirrors it in the same sort of way. Culture is a social lubricant. It kind of helps to tell stories that are relatable to people. We fight for slavery's abolishment, Wolfgang. That is why my address must stay strictly private, understood? For Chicago Tonight, I'm Angel Edo. And you can see this production of The Chevalier through Sunday. Visit our website for more information. Now, Paris, we toss it back to you. All right, thanks, Brandis. And still to come on Chicago Tonight, City Council Committee members pass Mayor Lori Lightfoot's controversial gang profits ordinance. We share the details. How Ukrainian Americans are working to support families abroad. We talk with two community leaders about leading such efforts in Ukraine. Blues in the Night on stage at Porchlight Music Theater, plus four more recommendations from theater critic Hetty Weiss. And prolific writer P.J. O'Rourke died this week. We'll take another look at some of our 2015 interview with the political satirist. But first, some more of today's top stories. A key city council panel narrowly endorses a proposal to settle a lawsuit for $1.67 million filed by five people who were pulled from their car by seven Chicago police officers. The incident occurred near Brickyard Mall amid the unrest that swept the city after the police murder of George Floyd in the summer of 2020. The settlement was the largest of three tied to allegations of police wrongdoing on the city council's finance committee agenda earlier today. The proposal will go before the full city council for a final vote next Wednesday. A man upset over multiple traffic citations allegedly began stalking Mayor Lori Lightfoot near her home over the course of a month. Prosecutors say 37-year-old Joseph Iguatua repeatedly drove by her residence while carrying a firearm that he fired five times in a nearby alley. Iguatua has been charged with one felony count of reckless discharge of a weapon and three felony counts of stalking. Igartua was ordered held without bail during a hearing today. And you can find more on this story on our website. Cleanup for Great Lake Harbors and Tributary Rivers is receiving a $1 billion boost from the federal infrastructure plan amid bipartisan support. Waukegan is among the 22 sites set to receive a long-awaited cleanup before 2030. Senior White House officials say these sites were designated a quarter century ago as among the region's most degraded after being plagued by industrial toxins. The waterways support more than 1.3 million jobs in manufacturing, tourism, transportation, warehousing, farming, and fishing, according to President Biden. And now back to Brandis. Paris, thank you. 
Mayor Lori Lightfoot's controversial plan to fight crime by going after the profits of gang members will advance to the full city council for a final vote. That's after the Public Safety Committee endorsed the measure today with a 10 to 4 vote. But much of the hearing focused on concerns from opponents that the measure would target black and Latino Chicagoans while doing nothing to stop violent crime. WTTW News reporter Heather Sharon has been covering this and she's back with more. So Heather, supporters of the mayor's plan said that it's a tool that the city needs to fight crime. How did they convince a majority of the committee uh, to send this to the full city council? Well, honestly, they didn't have to work that hard, Brandis, because the Public Safety Committee is made up of some of the city council's most conservative and pro-police members. So when they heard Deputy Mayor John O'Malley and Chicago Police Department Deputy Chief Ernest Cato say, we need this tool and it will help us stop crime, they were sold and that's all they needed to hear to send it to the full city council on Wednesday. So to that end, did they make any progress in winning over progressive members of the city council who have blocked a vote on this for five months. They did not, even though they were repeatedly pressed by those progressive members to share any data that they could to prove that this would be an effective tool to fight crime and that it would not disproportionately charge poor black and Latinos in Chicago. Um, they said flat out they don't have any evidence to prove that, but they're certain that it would serve to fight crime and as a deterrent. Uh, the progressive aldermen were not convinced and they most four four aldermen voted no but many more plan to vote no on Wednesday okay and on Wednesday obviously what happened today this sets up a showdown uh, for when it does get to the full city council on Wednesday does it have the votes to pass that is the crucial question and I don't know the answer to that question um, it will be a big test of Mayor Lori Lightfoot's ability to find 26 votes she will no doubt be making a lot of phone calls and telling aldermen that this will give them a way to say, if nothing else, that they are fighting crime at a time when murders and carjackings are still on the rise. Progressive members of the city council are going to argue that that's not a good enough reason to make such a significant change. Okay, I'm sure you'll be keeping an eye on this for us. Uh, Heather Sharon, thanks much. Thanks, Brandis. And you can read Heather's full story on our website, wttw.com slash news. And now, Paris, we toss it back to you. All right, thanks, Brandis. And now we go back to Amanda Vinicky, who has spent the day in Ukrainian Village as part of our In Your Neighborhood series. Amanda. Yes, Paris, I am joined now by the board president of the Ukrainian National Museum. That's Lydia Tukachuk. And thank you so much for being here with us and especially for keeping us out of that snowstorm, offering safe haven. This is a multi-level museum. Can you tell us a bit about what all its offerings are in its history in Chicago? So the museum was founded in 1952. This year we're going to celebrate the 70th anniversary. It was founded by three gentlemen who came here after World War II from Ukraine via the displaced persons camps. And originally it was intended to be an archival center, but uh, as they gathered more artifacts and, uh, and actually received artifacts from a museum in California that closed down, it developed into a larger museum, which has an ethnographic collection and a historical collection. It has archives. It has a religious section, has the Ukrainian-American veterans. So it's very diverse. And we're in that ethnographic section right here. It is very beautiful, colorful. You have a, a favorite that you'd like to highlight? Oh, of course I do. And it's the uh, costume right there. It's from the, uh, the Carpathian Mountains. It's called the uh, Hutsulski Stri. It's gorgeous. I'd love to, have you ever put it on? Well, not that one. I have my but own. But you got your own. Okay, <laughs> yes, there yes. we go. Uh, let, let's turn now to serious matters. We've been spending the day talking about the crisis in Ukraine with a potential invasion from Russia. You have some distant family there. What are you hearing from those in Ukraine? So I have family and friends, and um, most of my, my family is in western Ukraine. However, I do have family in eastern Ukraine, and I spoke with them yesterday. I couldn't reach my niece, so I called her husband, and he said that he moved his wife and children to the western part of Ukraine, to her hometown, because she's from western Ukraine. He and his brother-in-law remained in Kiev. And what is their expectation? Are they girding for battle? 
Well, they said they're not panicking. That's what they've been living with all the time, the war on the Eastern Front. And they said they need to go about their daily lives, but they are getting ready. He said his ammunition is cleaned and he's ready to fight. How is that having an impact, if at all, here in Chicago, particularly in Ukrainian village, where there's a large Ukrainian American population? Well, it affects the families here very much so, because there are many families that only the wife is here or the husband and the rest of the family is in Ukraine. So they're concerned either about their children, about their grandparents. They, there is a very big concern about that. And how could you not be? How do you feel as if the United States and the Biden administration has been handling this situation? So far, I think they're handling it very well, and I hope that it will continue that way. I think that they're doing a good job. I see that they're really concerned, and they're trying to have other countries be just as concerned and to do their work as well. Any next steps that you believe the president in the United States needs to take? Well, if they say that they're taking sanctions, that they will be taking sanctions, they should, because this affects people financially. It even affects cultural diplomacy. It affects so much, and thank you very much for sharing that story, and best wishes, of course, to your family and friends in Ukraine. Once again, that was the president of the board of the Ukrainian National Museum here in Chicago, Chicago Lydia Tukachuk. We will have more from the museum later, but for now, sending it back to you in the studio. All right, Amanda, we'll look forward to that a bit later in the show. And up next, show recommendations ahead of Chicago Theater Week. But first, we take a look at that weather. Chicago Theater Week begins today. That's when lots of local stages offer deals on tickets through the end of February. And joining us with her recommendations of what's playing at the Playhouses is arts critic Hetty Weiss. Hetty, great to see you as always. Uh, let's start with Gem of the Ocean, which premiered at the Goodman Theater back in 2003. So tell us the backdrop of this August Wilson epic. Well, this is the chronologically first play in uh, August Wilson's 10 play cycle for each decade of the 20th century. Uh, he wrote it near at the end, but he it, it's about the beginning. And it is such a powerful play directed by Chuck Smith with fabulous performances. And it what it does is it goes back, uh, it's, it's set in Pittsburgh, but it, it is the story of Aunt Esther, who says she's 280 or 300 years old, which means she came over on the early shaves, uh, slave ships. And the young man, the young black guy from the South who has come North, and she has to teach him a lot of lessons. And she does it in what is almost like an aria about the journey uh, across the ocean and to, uh, this this city of um, uh, the city of bones, which is what she calls it. But there's so much more to the show. I don't want to give away the whole story, but it's really it's about a household in uh, Pittsburgh at a at a rough time, and you go away and you really think that you've been oh I don't know raised. <laughs> that's the best word. That's a that's a ringing endorsement. And set in Pittsburgh, as so many August Wilson plays are. Uh, next up, we have Relentless at Timeline Theater, which is written by someone you call perhaps uh, a burgeoning August Wilson successor. Well, she's a female. I think she might be the female alternative to August Wilson. She wrote a play that's uh, set in 1919, and it's about an aspect of Black culture that really has been ignored. Uh, it's called the Black Victorians, and they're the people who, although their grandparents and their parents were part of, were involved in slavery, uh, they're free, and for various reasons, uh, they've been educated, and they actually now uh, are part of the Black elite, the Black bourgeoisie. And it's about two sisters who go and are about to empty the home of their mother, who has just passed away. And in a series of diaries, 
they find out the truth of the past, which they never knew. And it's a fascinating play, beautifully written, beautifully acted, uh, directed by Ron O.J. Parson. And uh, I think it's only going to run for about another eight or nine days. So I hope people will go see it. So theater week, the perfect time to go see that at the Timeline Theater, Relentless. Okay, next we have Women of Soul. This sounds amazing. It is, uh, it is sort of a tribute to all the great soul singers uh, in history, rock history, soul history, Aretha Franklin, um, Amy Winehouse. But it's more than just uh, a musical review, correct? It is. It's beautifully put together. It's a little bit on a time frame from the earliest to the latest. And also about how different all of these women were, some of them religious, some of them, uh, you know, hipsters. Uh, it, it's a very, um, it's a very uh, uh, varied thing. See Janis Joplin, uh, Joplin right there. Sorry to, sorry to interrupt. But yes, and, and each of the actresses really captures the sound of, of the singers' voices that we know so well. And at the end of the show, there's a tribute to Aretha Franklin. Well, and that's what I was going to ask you. So are all of these women uh, sort of uh, sound alikes for, for the likes of Mavis Staples and Mahalia Jackson and Janis Joplin, so on and so on? They really have caught the timbre of the voices and the personalities. And uh, uh, they are dressed up to the nines. And uh, I think it's a show that's really worth seeing. That sounds like a lot of fun to go watch. All right, we have another review, Blues in the Night. Uh, this is one that's been around for a while. Uh, tell us about this one and, and some of the songwriters that are represented here. It has. Uh, this one has been around since the early 1980s. And it's actually set in 1938, the end of the Depression. And it's about three women with all at different ages and with all kinds of problems. Uh, love, you know, love affair problems, money problems, life problems in general. And they all live in single room occupancy hotels, uh, a, a hotel uh, that was once probably pretty posh, but it's now down in heels. And they they sing it. It, ha it sort of follows a line of their, uh, you know, life at the moment. And so all the songs are blues songs. Uh, and some other uh, famous songs uh, that they sing, and they're fabulous. Uh, Felicia Fields leads it, and Donny Chalin, and uh, Claire Kennedy, and the three of them are just wonderful. And then there are two guys, uh, one who is a dancer, who really is kind of the backdrop for the whole thing, and then a um, singer at the hotel who has his own uh, issues with girls. <laughs> Let's move on to West Side Story at the Marriott Lincolnshire. Obviously, uh, we know about the Steven Spielberg big screen adaptation. How does this one stack up? Well, I didn't. I haven't seen the movie because the original movie is such a favorite of mine. But you know, this is a very intimate space. It's in the round, and the dancing choreographed by Andre uh, by uh, Alex Sanchez, who also did the, uh, some of the dance setting for uh, Paradise Square, which is going to Broadway, is. Terrific, and uh, the voices are great, and it's just wonderful to hear this Bernstein, Sondheim, Jerome Robbins musical again. They always do such elaborate productions on that very intimate stage out there at Marriott. All right, Hedy, thank you so much. A lot of wonderful selections uh, for Chicago Theater Week. Thanks, as it always. Is. It is. Thank you, Paris. And we're back with more right after this. And now we check back in with Amanda Venicky, who spent the day in Ukrainian Village as part of our In Your Neighborhood series. Amanda. Yes, Brandis. I'm joined now by Pavlo Bendrisky. He is the president of the Ukrainian Congress Committee of America, Illinois Division. So thank you so much for being here with us. What is the Ukrainian Congress Committee of America and what role does it play? 
Ukrainian Congress Committee of uh, America, or what we call the UCCA, it's a little easier for you, uh, is the umbrella organization that unites the Ukrainian diaspora here in the United States. It's comprised of some 30 different uh, organizations, women's groups, youth groups, Ukrainian American veterans, and, and others under one umbrella. And it was formed in 1940 so that Ukrainians at that time and then going forward would be able to speak with one voice about our concerns, to be able to preserve our culture, our tradition, our language here in the United States. And we've also over the years have come to advocate for uh, certainly very strong bilateral relations between Ukraine and the United States and also are advocating issues that are important to us Americans of Ukrainian heritage. And I imagine the Illinois chapter is quite strong given the population of Ukrainian Americans in Chicago. Well, others say that we're the best. We're too modest to admit that, but uh, we uh, are very active and uh, we're very fortunate to have a great team of very committed people that uh, really help us get all of our work done. So what have the work have you been doing now amid the tension with Russia? Well, we've been working on several different uh, levels. Uh, we've been doing a lot in terms of building awareness. Uh, many Americans don't know all the nuances and details of what's happening in Ukraine, why it's happening in Ukraine, what the Russian aggression is all about, and we want to help uh, clear up some of that information. Uh, we've been working on keeping our uh, federal legislators, our senators and our congressmen informed about issues that are important to us, and we've been certainly advocating for strong sanctions. We think that sanctions need to be applied now, before the invasion happens. Uh, up to now, 14,000 people have been killed over the last eight years with the invasion of Russia. It could number into the hundreds of thousands if those sanctions are not applied at this time. What sort of response are you getting from the Illinois delegation? They're very positive, they understand, and uh, I understand that once uh, they come back from their uh, brief recess, there's going to be talk. There are two current bills in Congress right now. Uh, that are partisan bills. We're looking to get the uh, partisanship behind them and make it bipartisan. And that's the one thing that uh, Ukraine has enjoyed was very strong bipartisan support uh, out of Washington. And now we have just about a minute left. What can you tell us about something that maybe has been ignored in all of the attention and conversation that is the impact of the potential Russian aggression, even the threat of it on indigenous peoples? Well, the uh, Crimean Peninsula has been home to the uh, Crimean Tatars for hundreds of years. They suffered a horrible genocide during Stalin's time when they were deported to Asia. They came back, resettled, and since Russia has illegally and occupied that land uh, over the last eight years, they've closed down their places of worship, they've closed down their schools. Leaders have been of the Tatar community have been arrested. Uh, there have been people of Tatar uh, community who have been killed and so forth. A lot of repression going on, a lot of human rights violations going on against those indigenous people. So much, and I know you as well have family, friends in Ukraine, I imagine, so best wishes to them. We thank you for sharing your insight with us here on Chicago tonight. Once again, that was Pavlo Bandrisky. He is the vice president of the Ukrainian Congress Committee of America's Illinois Division. And right now, Brandis, sending it back to you. Yeah, and Amanda, I learned a lot during that interview. Um, before we let you go, though, we are all grateful that the museum has been gracious enough to, to host you and the crew and keep you all out of the snow. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit more about what's going on there? I am particularly grateful for that, yes, and especially hosting right here. So actually, Brandis, I, I don't know if you can get a view of it, but I'm standing aside some really gorgeous folk art that is called Pisanka. I, I'm hoping I'm pronouncing that all right. All right. I've gotten a couple of Ukrainian language <laughs> lessons on the fly here. But these are Easter eggs, actual eggs, although hollow by now, that are not painted, although they look at instead of it as many layers of dipped, uh, sort of like the batik method. And these are eggs that tell a story, that share a message. And often that is a message of hope, of new life, of spring, and that is why they come for Easter. So if you come to visit, there's a goose egg, an ostrich egg, plenty to see here. And that's all that we have from Ukrainian Village this evening. I'll send it back to you. Come check it out at the museum. Looks very cool. Thank you, Amanda. And we're back with more right after this.
Don't miss one of our stories. Get them all delivered to your desktop or mobile device with a subscription to the WTTW News Daily Briefing. Go to WTTW.com slash Daily Briefing and sign up. Longtime author and political satirist P.J. O'Rourke died this week from lung cancer. O'Rourke wrote for everyone from the National Lampoon to the Weekly Standard, covering national politics, war, and everyday life. A native of Toledo, Ohio, his mother's family was from Chicago, and he spent two years at Oak Park and River Forest High School. Well known for his conservative and libertarian politics, O'Rourke was raised in what he called a rock-ribbed Republican family. But as he told Phil Ponce in 2015, he briefly strayed during young adulthood. The first weekend of my freshman year, I was walking down this alley in the college town. I went to Miami of Ohio in Oxford, Ohio. One side of the alley was the, like the frat and sorority bar. <laughs> And boy, those girls were cute. They were really cute. But, you know, I wasn't a star athlete. I wasn't a rich kid. I wasn't a sharp dresser. Over on the other side of the alley, there were equally cute girls strumming guitars, smoking camel cigarettes, drinking beer straight out of the bottle. And I thought, I might stand a <laughs> chance over there. And so that's, so I come home. I, I was raised in a rock rib Republican family. I come home with my hair down to my behind big red fist on the back of my jacket. My grandmother looks at me and she says, Pat, I'm worried about you. Are you becoming a Democrat? <laughs> Grandma, Lyndon Johnson's a Democrat and he's murdering all these innocent Viet Cong and so on and so forth. Of course I'm not a Democrat. I'm a communist. And my grandmother said, just as long as you're not a Democrat. <laughs> P.J. O'Rourke died Tuesday at his home in New Hampshire. He was 74 years old. And we're back to wrap things up right after this. Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by Alexandra and John Nichols, the Jim and Kay Maybe family, the Polk Brothers Foundation, and the support of these donors. And that's our show for this Thursday night. Don't forget to stay connected with us by signing up for our daily briefing. And you can get Chicago Tonight streamed on Facebook, YouTube, and our website, WTTW.com slash news. You can also get the show via podcast and the PBS video app. And please join us tomorrow night at 7 for the Week in Review. Now, for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, I'm Brandis Friedman. And I'm Paris Schutz. Thank you so much for watching. Stay healthy and safe out there, and good night. Closed captioning is made possible by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, a Chicago personal injury and wrongful death firm that supports free educational initiatives in the legal profession.